the session. So that's what I'm going to talk about, international adjustment and the Great Recession, because there has been a tremendous amount of international adjustment, and some important questions remain as to what's going to happen going forward. Uh, I'll give you a, some, like, let's look at the past, but let's also look at how the past is going to perhaps give us some perspective and some questions about going forward. So the first thing I want to do is like, okay, why do we want to look at this questions through the international lens? You know, you're here because you're interested in globalization across a, a multiple range of dimensions. But a legitimate question is what can we learn about the adjustment that's happening, the recession in the US economy, its implications by looking at the international data. So that's the first question. Um, then I particularly want to hone in a little bit more on the domestic side of the adjustment process, comparing this recession to other ones in the past, the not so recent past, and then the international part. Then I'm going to dig down further. This is kind of like one of those onion uh, presentations. You start with the big picture, and then you peel off, and you look at some other pictures down underneath. So I want to look at the adjustment that we're observing in terms of trade patterns, the types of products that have been the most uh, significant in the adjustment process, both on imports and exports. But I also want to look at the regions of the world and which regions of the world have done the most adjusting either on the import side and then on the export side. Um, then I want to change perspective and look at assets, meaning the adjustment that we've been observing in the international capital flows and asset markets, financial markets, uh, not only in terms of the type of instruments, meaning is it banks, is it stocks, is it US Treasury securities, uh, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac securities, not only the adjustment that's happening in those types of financial instruments, but also what kind of adjustment is happening in terms of the maturity structure of those investments, and importantly, on ownership, national ownership. Uh, then I'm going to conclude with, at the end of the day, after we look at all this stuff, are there any observations that we want to make for policymakers? either on the fiscal side, meaning Congress and the President, versus and or on the financial side, meaning the Central Bank and the Treasury Department. So that's our agenda. So kind of a lot to do, but we'll see how far we get. Uh, we'll definitely get to the policymaker part. <laughs> Uh, okay, so why an international lens? Why is it important to think about the adjustment process happening in the international arena? Well, let's first talk about how exposed the U.S. economy is to international trade. Uh, exports and imports, which are the two ways we measure trade. Um, exports are obviously the ones we sell abroad, and imports are the products we buy um, as U.S. consumers and business. So one way to think about that is the sum total of exports and imports as a share of real GDP is trade exposure. In 1980, which was the last time we had a, a really good recession, um, imports and exports were only 12% of real GDP, relatively small. Um, before we started this recession, the trade exposure of the US economy was 28%. So one third of uh, US GDP on average, across sectors, were exposed to international competition, either because they were selling products abroad for <laughs> exports, or they were buying from abroad, or of course, in most cases, both, both as an exporter and an importer. So we're much more exposed as producers, as consumers, and as employees to international markets. The second reason for looking at the international lens is the financial exposure. And the way we want to measure that is cross-border financial flows. So when you buy um, stocks in Toyota, well, that's a cross-border financial flow because they're a foreign company. If you buy uh, an index fund, uh, you know, Pacific fund that buys into stocks in Taiwan, China, and so forth, that's a cross-border financial flow. 
When a foreign company buys a U.S. corporation, that's a financial inflow. So these uh, cross-border financial flows as a share of nominal GDP were in 1980, only 5% of nominal GDP was the share of cross-border financial flows. So very small. Basically, there was not a lot of cross-border financial flows back in 1980, last time we had the good recession. In 2007, which was just before the onset of our subprime meltdown, cross-border financial flows were as a ratio of nominal GDP 25%. So that tells you how dramatic the increase is uh, in cross-border financial flows. Now I put here what has happened in last year or two years ago, kind of right before the subprime meltdown, cross-border financial flows, flows, dramatic contraction, so from 25% of GDP to 4% of GDP, and in the depth of the recession, essentially cross-border financial flows are frozen. You weren't buying stuff abroad and you're adding to your portfolio. Foreigners, really, in general, on average, weren't either, although we're going to find that there were some players out there in the financial markets that continued to take very big positions in the U.S. economy. And that takes us to our third measure of financial exposure, which is the official exposure. The official exposure is foreign official institutions. Sometimes they're called sovereign wealth funds. Not all sovereign wealth funds are official, but a lot of them are. <coughs> foreign central banks holding of international reserves. Official exposure. Uh, what do they hold? Uh, they hold a range of instruments, but primarily they hold U.S. Treasury <coughs> obligations. They are official obligations of the U.S. government, the U.S. Treasury security. So the official uh, exposure is foreign holdings of U.S. Treasury securities as a share of debt held by the public, meaning you, me, and foreigners. So the total debt held by the public. So back in the 1980s, foreign holding of U.S. Treasury securities as a share of the U.S. Treasury securities out there was about 20%. In 2008, 50% of all of the U.S. Treasury securities ever issued by the U.S. government, held by the public, 50% of that was owned by foreigners, of which, uh, and 35%, so 35% is how much of that is owned by foreign official entities. Okay? So official to official is a really big number. It's even bigger than either of these other measures of exposure. So our official relationships, a lot of politics involved, a lot of economics involved, uh, that foreign official exposure is a pretty big number and it warrants closer analysis and discussion. So we're going to do that. Okay, so moving on now to looking at the overall adjustment process. Uh, if we look at the U.S. economy and we kind of divide up the economy and the adjustment process into how much has the domestic economy responded, consumers and business investment, that's the tall red bars. How much has the adjustment happened in the external accounts, meaning exports and imports, that's the blue bars. So we've got the 1980-82 recession period, and then we have the next big recession that we've had, we had in the, in the most recent, you know, kind of recent lifetime, is 1990-91, and then we've got the current one that's ongoing. The vertical axis is the contribution of these adjustments to the overall change in GDP growth. So a really tall positive bar like you see in the 1980s period in the, in the red bars, and then the big red bars that are underneath the zero, basically 1980, 82, the red bars are basically all bigger than the blue bars. And that's saying that most of the adjustment, the most of the reason why GDP fell 
and in the recession in 1980 and 81. That's because of what happened in the domestic economy. Now, in the 1990-91 recession, again, you look at those bars and you say, well, you know, first they're not as big, either positive or negative. 91-92 wasn't as big a recession as 80-82. But the other thing that you observe from those bars is that basically the blue bars are kind of small compared to the red bars. So, story in 1990-91, once again, is the adjustment was happening in the domestic economy much more than in the exports and imports part of the economy, the international adjustment. Now we go forward to our uh, current period, and if we look at that, Basically, you know, the adjustment in the domestic economy is big, the red bars being all negative. Yes, big adjustment in the domestic part of the economy, but all of the blue bars are above zero. That means throughout this entire recession, as the domestic part of the economy was really contracting and making GDP growth really negative, the international part of the economy was positive, was actually making GDP less negative than it otherwise would have been. And that is something that we don't generally observe if we look in the past recessions, and we certainly don't see the international adjustment being such a large positive contributor to the domestic adjustment process. So in today's recession, even though it's really bad, and still is, the international part of the adjustment has been a bright light, the silver lining, if you want to call it. It's been a positive contributor to the overall adjustment process. Okay, so that's the overall picture. Now we're going to start digging down or peeling off those uh, onion pieces. And the first peel of the onion is to look at the two components of the adjustment process on the external side. Those two components are exports and imports. So I've got a graph of them here. It goes from 1999 up to uh, the middle of last year, or the, uh, yeah, the middle of last year, which is about as recently as available. We have another quarter. Uh, and uh, then we have the amount of uh, trade, exports and imports, on the vertical axis. So the first thing that you observe in the red lines is uh, imports, and the black line is exports. So how much adjustment actually took place? Well, from 1999 up to about the middle of 2008, imports were rising. Imports including oil, which is the dotted line, they were rising too. Exports were rising a lot. So up until 2008, at the end of 2008, trade was still rising. Things were still doing well. That's when the economy started to fall apart, in the middle of 2008. And as a consequence, imports started to contract. When you, when you didn't buy as much, uh, either you didn't put so much gas in your car, you didn't go shopping for that new flat panel display, you didn't buy the new Prada purse, all that meant that imports started to contract dramatically. And in fact, from the amount of the contraction was in two quarters, 30% of imports disappeared. It's as if you stop shopping, you know, 30 cents of every dollar that you used to spend on imports in just two quarters disappeared. That is a unprecedented contraction in what you're buying, what you and businesses buy. Now, the export contraction was already also really big, but not, not quite as large, but, but pretty big. So 24% of exports. In other words, if you were working for a factory or you were writing computer programming programs for a company abroad or you're a consultant working for a company in Germany, those are all exports. Uh, in two quarters, the uh, export decline, the business decline, your job, 
uh, disappeared. One in four dollars disappeared. 25 cents of every dollar disappeared. And if jobs are one for one with every dollar, which isn't quite true, but let's just suppose it is, that meant 24% of the people who were employed in the export industry in the middle of 2008 no longer had jobs. So that says just how large and secondly how fast the adjustment process was in this recession. Want to dig down deeper. Um, in which sectors, which industries did the adjustment process happen the most? Where was the adjustment taking place? Was it actually you not buying the flat panel display and you not buying the product purse? Or was it business not buying the new piece of machinery, business not buying the parts and inputs? So I have here, uh, color-coded, uh, decomposition of the kinds of things that the United States imports. Green, it represents investment goods, things that are like used on the factory floor, things that are used as an input to the production process. Red is all kinds of different things that consumers buy. The dark red is durable goods, so that would be your flat panel display. The red that's got the, the horizontal lines in it, that's autos and auto parts. And that little bit in the middle there is things like shoes and clothing. So when you stopped buying, when you got really worried, you took it out on durable goods. You stopped shopping for refrigerators. You didn't buy the flat panel display, but really, you took it out on the auto industry. And we see that not just in, of course, the U.S. auto industry, but we see that, we saw that reflected in the first loss uh, for Toyota in their history. Uh, so the adjustment process dramatically was in the consumer goods sector. Autos and durables led the contraction. But if we look at the most recent bar, which is still negative, but you can see that the red part of that bar has gone away. So the consumer contraction, if we look at the episode through the lens of the international adjustment, the consumer contraction is over. However, if you're a business, you're still contracting. And you're taking it out on the types of things that businesses put on the factory floor, capital goods, which is the solid green, semiconductors, computers. Uh, and you're also not buying um, chemicals and other in, uh, industrial supplies. So if we, the takeaway from this picture is that the consumer contraction, as bad as it was for automobiles and other consumer uh, durables, that contraction is over, but the business contraction continues. It's important because if we think about what we should be trying to revive, the international lens tells us something about that uh, a policy objective. Okay, now, how about the pattern of adjustment in terms of who we stopped buying from? Not the industries now, but the countries. So I've got the same kind of diagram here, where in the beginning, in the beginning of the um, recession period, uh, imports were still positive, we knew that. Uh, in the middle of the recession period, we had really dramatic reductions in imports. We just saw that. Now, who did we stop buying from? The top dark purple, or pink, whatever, I guess it's pink-ish, uh, that's Europe. So we did stop buying from Europe. And you can see over in this chart that in 2004, we tended to buy about 21.8% of our product, uh, our imports came from Europe. And the adjustment, however, from Europe has only been 17%. So Europe 
has taken up a little bit less of the adjustment than we would have expected based on their share of trading. Adjustment, yes, but not too much, not too bad. Uh, Canada, which is the yellow, big adjustment, but if you look over on the table, a little bit more than what you would have expected based on their share of trade. Latin America is in the pink, about what you would have expected, taking the brunt of the adjustment, we're not buying as much from them. And then there are uh, the aqua color is Asia Pacific excluding China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Japan. The gray-ish, uh, before you get to the dark blue, that's China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. The dark blue is Japan. So if we look over to our table, uh, well, if, first, if, if we look at our, our bars, we say, oh, you know, Asia took a lot of a, a big hit. If you, look at the, if, if you look at the bars, you'd say, yes, Asia took a lot of a hit. We didn't buy stuff from Asia. But if you look at, over at the table and the inset, if you add up Asia, we used to buy 37% of our product, of our imports, in 2004 came from Asia. But if we think about the adjustment, what share of the adjustment burden was absorbed by Asia, it's only 27%. So it's much less than we would have expected based on shares of trade. And in that sense, Asia continued to export more to the United States than, quote, quote, they should have based on the pattern of consumption and investment. Why is that? A couple of different potential reasons, but one of them, of course, is that the Asian currencies have uh, appreciated much less, if at all, against the dollar. So their products have continued to be very cheaply priced and so, of course, we continue to buy them. So now let's change our perspective to the implications of this recessionary adjustment for U.S. producers. They're going to buy, you know, U.S. producers are the exporters. So we're going to do the same exercise and see which producer class has been most affected by the recession. Once again, what we're observing here is in our uh, center panel, our big, our big reductions in, ex in exports, all the down bars are negative, that investment goods, which are the green ones, the investment goods, the decline in those capital goods, manufacturing, computers, uh, machinery, uh, investment goods have had a catastrophic decline. Uh, catastrophic decline in our exports of manufactured products. The auto, auto uh, which is the, again, the horizontal red bar, yeah, they, had, they didn't export as much. But uh, once again, if we look at the final bar, which is what's kind of going on today, you see the same story. The investment decline continues. The consumer goods situation is stabilized. So globally, this is not any longer a consumer recession, even though you might not feel very good about things. This is a global business recession, and it's hitting the US investment goods sector uh, really quite dramatically hard. What about which countries have taken have been the most abrupt adjusters? Which countries said, we can't buy from you anymore? So it's the same exercise as I did before, where we're going to look at, uh, in the table, in the first column of the table, uh, what was, you know, how important were certain regions of the world in buying our exports before the recession started. Well, we sold about 23% of our exports to Europe, 
about 23% of our exports to Canada, about 21% of our exports to Latin America and the other Western Hemisphere, which includes the Caribbean and Mexico. Um, and we um, sold about, uh, uh, let's see, to Asia in the neighborhood of uh, 20, 30, yeah, about 35% of our exports went to Asia. What about the share of adjustment? <coughs> Looking over, Ooh. can you see those numbers? No, no that's too bad. Uh, well